Welcome to the Agile People FikaCast. We talk about how to navigate with agility in our organizations. So, welcome everyone to the Agile People Fika. This is a small pod- podcast where we will talk uh, or try to talk about different su- subjects. Uh, in Swedish we call that provprata. It's uh, when you throw in a subject and then you let's see where we end up. Uh, it's nothing planned. It's just a subject that we will talk about. And today's subject it's about resource allocation budget or if we should prioritize the flexibility with people. So let's dig into that and see where we end up. And today we are a couple of people from Agile People, and we also have David Thompson with us. So welcome. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Daniel. So uh, I think, yeah. yeah, I think for me it, it it boils down quite a lot to if we measure value or if we measure cost. And I see that the tendency that many seem to to count IT as a cost instead of seeing that the, the, the heart and soul of the company producing the value and then it's a value creating um, not department because we shouldn't silo each other anyway, but it's it's a, it's a value creation instead of a cost creation or cost center. And I think that is the, the the key difference in the points of view here, I think. Mm-hmm. And of course, when we when we look at the world we live in and the, the volatility and complexity and all that that we're in, we need to be able to be flexible. So I, for me, that points strongly towards the, the risks of having budgets. I've seen um, during my, my years that, for instance, one team, they had this huge this idea of a great innovation that could uh, potentially save their customers lots and lots of money, but they didn't have the budget in that money bag. They had budgets in other money bags and that completely then hindered value creation in that, in that uh, scenario. Mm. So just as an example, since the budget seem tend to lock in people into not being that innovative and not being that forward leaning but just delivering on on uh, committed deadlines for instance because you have committed or set up a project according to your budgets and then you strive to deliver that and you don't become very innovative i think i think you're governed by those budgets and the performance targets that are linked to those budgets as well Mm -hmm. and as long as you are governed by that this will be your priority if you are not governed by that fixed target for your department or your team or your area, then you could be free to share your resources where it was really needed instead yeah. of trying to safeguard and, and you know keep all your resources for yourself, even if they are not utilized to 100% to try to keep the resources for yourself, right? Uh, yeah. if, if you weren't governed by fixed performance targets on a, on a, and sub-optimizing them for a part of the organization, then you could share where, where, oh, we see it's a bottleneck over there. Can we help you? How can we support to remove that bottleneck? You know, And then you can share your resources. So mm-hmm. dynamic resource allocation could happen in that case if we didn't govern by fixed performance targets. So, but we have, my take. we also have people that uh, maybe holds the m- money bag uh, and they, uh, they don't want uh, things to go, uh, go crazy in the organization. So how could we help them uh, in that scenario then, Pienia? Yeah, what is go crazy? Um, <laughs> what's the definition <laughs> of go crazy? <laughs> Uh, is it to is it crazy to allocate resources to the places where it's really needed right now? Is that craziness? I don't agree. Um, but just because things didn't turn out like we thought, 
in October or November previous year, it doesn't may mean that we go crazy. It means that we adapt to reality. And I think that's a lot of common sense instead of craziness. <laughs> but still, we, we maybe just have a set of money and we cannot break that uh, number. Um, so, of course, we should use that money in the best way. But exactly. You should you should use the money in the best possible way. What you want is the most bang for the buck that you have, mm. right? Yeah. So, so this is really using the resources in the wisest way possible. Because if you hold on to your resources and they are not used because you don't have a need right now for them, and you see that somebody else needs the resources, what's the most w wise way to use your money by? Uh, yeah. It's to share, right? Then create it's common sense patient budget. It's uh, maybe creates a false safe or something that yeah we give them that amount of money and them that, that amount of money and then we have control of the over the costs that we have. So and um, what um, is control? <laughs> what is control? Can we answer that question? Maybe I, I threw it out to you. What is control? <laughs> to be able to sleep at night, <laughs> not go bankrupt. I play that person. Yes, yes. Do we go bankrupt if we use the resources wisely? Or do we get, go bankrupt if we don't? Yeah, and my, um, they're mm. wisely. How do we build in wisely? So we are not overspending. So yes. how do we handle that? I, are, you, are you referring to me or somebody yeah. else? Anybody, right? Know. <laughs> what is using the money wisely is to use them where they are needed the most at the time they are needed. That's wisely yeah. in my in yeah. my head. Yeah. So, so mm -hmm. what it's it, it's that we maybe are doing something else, creating that con or sense of control, but in a whole different way. So we are spending where we should spend, but we are not overspending, and we have mm -hmm. we have a system that can take responsibility over the spending also they have uh, maybe transparency uh, into the budgets that we have and um, can take that responsibility as an organization then mm -hmm. being given money for their own uh, for, for their different apartments or teams or whatever it is mm -hmm. I, I guess oh, it go, depends go. how good we are at predicting the future isn't it it's, it's okay as we mentioned last week about budgeting, um, but it's it's, it's always pr predictive. It's never reactive, um, and so whatever your best guess is today is you know that can go out the window very quickly. Mm -hmm. And so if I think of my world, which would be consulting, and and if it's a discrete project, then how are you resourcing that? And in terms of the people, not everybody comes on day one. You know, people come staggered during the different development stages and you know and that's deemed to be the most I guess equitable way of sort of managing that resource but again what we're not managing um again is is how effective that is you know what's the, what's the efficiency it's literally you're applying um, getting bodies on the ground for particular stages but that doesn't mean say they're going to be so effective mm -hmm. um no. you know it's and and then uh, the, to even getting the, the subject of bankruptcy again if we are re resourcing on a discrete project and that's running well and it's it's you know that's that's that doesn't mean to say the company can't go bankrupt because the company will be running lots of discrete projects and there'll be their business as usual activities etc as well so lots of things can contribute to uh, a company's downfall and i guess it, it, it's as, as we keep coming back to it's Part of a company, uh, an organization can't just be the one that seems to be agile. It has to be the whole organization that, that buys into it. And, and I appreciate that we're still at very much at that infancy. We, we see very little companies who are completely agile, you know, and, um, and until we start kind of correcting some of those, those behaviors and the understandings, then, you know, um, all, all the good work in some areas doesn't translate across the whole org, really. And I've seen that um, um, recently here in the UK, um, a number of public sector companies have gone bankrupt 
you know. Um, no, that doesn't mean to say they go out of business because the public sector, you know, it has to be retained. So it has to be, it has to be some sort of rescue package, and that that will happen, I'm sure. Um, but if it was a private sector or financial services, then that can easily, you know, um, um, falter, and, and a good few of them have, have happened in recent times as well. Mm -hmm. I agree completely. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's just a matter of time uh, before companies start to, to realize these things. Um, uh, we are focusing a lot in Agile People right now on this. And we have an yeah. upcoming certification in, in October where we will be focusing a lot on, on Agile for finance and how to think and how to act in an unpredictable world. Because we, we realize that this sense of control that we are after in finance and in the whole company is just a false sense of security. It's a false uh, belief that we can control people because we cannot control people. They are complex adaptive systems and we cannot control reality. What is going to happen? The future is not predictable. We don't have the crystal ball to look into. Uh, and when we realize that, uh, then it's a totally different solution that is required right uh, so so the, the budget ritual is because people are used to it it we always used to do budgets that's the way we do and uh, if you go to a budget meeting you're important uh, and this ritual is something that people stick to because they want to keep their power and status and it, it's human isn't it I guess. Yeah, but I also think that, that it is, is something about acting in a responsible way. And if we have that control or that perceived control mechanism, then we can always say that we acted in a responsible way. So what is the, the, the new way of acting in a responsible way when we accept the complexity we're in? Yes. The responsible thing is to adapt and change with reality not following a predefined plan that doesn't match reality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I mean, also, the, as I started with, to, to see, to measure value instead of just cost. Yes. I think. So what is the yes. potential in the value creation instead of what is the cost yeah. of that? Of course, you need to balance the two, but as long as you are on the plus side of things, that's, that's where you need to be. If, if we find an initiative along the way, I mean, during the year that we didn't even see or think of in, in, the, in, in the end of the last year, then we need to take that initiative and we, we need to do something about it. If we make a quick calculation, wow, this has huge potential compared to what we decided to do, then we mm. need to reprioritize yeah. uh, what yeah. we should be doing or not. Maybe it's a, it's a change in, in the program planning uh, and, and so on. And, and, but, but people also have a tendency to stick on to projects which they have invested a lot in. Have you noticed that? Yeah. Uh, that, that, oh, but we invested so much into this project. We cannot, you know, uh, see it as a sunk cost. We yeah. cannot just, <clears throat> just leave it to die now when we invested so much. So... And, and, and that's just stupid, really, to, to think like that. Mm. Very true. Exactly. Uh, not... And I think also, if you embrace agility at, at the heart of it, then you have the iteratively, incrementally de delivering value. And that on its own, if you, if you manage to, to tie a, uh, a different business model to that, then you reduce the risk as well. If you're long in, working long projects, of, of course, then you build up huge, huge risk of delivering something that's not really um, attractive from the customer's perspective. So if you cut that down into smaller deliveries, incremental deliveries, then you're, the, the cost isn't that, the risk isn't that high, actually. And then you are exactly. actually designed to, to pivot and to, to change direction. So you do an evaluation every time you finish a sprint. You say, yeah. should we continue now or not? Is yeah. there a chance that we could deliver more value or not? And we make that go-no-go no go decision after every sprint. Uh, this is a very good recipe for success. Mm -hmm. And I, 
as I see it there, it's it's very nice moving towards being more flexible be, with people, but you need to have more in the organization. We have been talking about some of them. And uh, w- one one more aspect, yeah, of course, the, the value creation that's connect, really connected to flow, as I see it. And here, yeah. like many public sectors are uh, su- suffering quite a lot because the system they have built, it's very silo oriented. And it, within those silos, there is a fixed budget with a fixed number of people. But those silos could be huge bottlenecks to create flow. And uh, that more or less damaged the whole system. So it's very little value coming out. Uh, and it's very costly to have sometimes a sick person moving through that system. Mm. And, and there is also the notion of uh, full-time employees, FTEs. So for this function, we need five FTEs you know, full-time uh, M- M- employees. But how do you know? I mean, it depends on what employees we have, right? If they are really focused, really engaged, and very motivated and skilled, and we don't need five FTEs, but, but we are treating people like they are resources here. We are treating people like they are changeable, like pieces in the puzzle, right? So, so this is also a fundamentally wrong um, thinking that we can just exchange one FTE for another one. We can't because people are different and can contribute in different ways. And it depends on many, many things if you can or not contribute uh, there you value. Are. Carry on to the classic one that, uh, yeah, they, we need to put some more effort into this. Just add some uh, some millions, mm. add, add three or four more people into yeah. something that is suffering from something else than the lack of resources or lack of people. They are maybe struggling mm. with something else, but it's really hard to see that from a distance. So instead, you just see it. It's we don't get the value we, we are looking for fast enough. Add more people, and then you add a lot of more complexity. And uh, you, of course, you need to train and onboard people, and that that's that's suffering. And then you also have all the communication ways between people, and all these things that is making us fail even. <laughs> and the loss in the end is maybe even bigger. I'm, th- I'm, I'm thinking maybe it would be better to decrease the number of people in in those instances that you are describing daniel maybe we, you should split it up in smaller teams instead and 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 maybe remove one person per team uh, and, and then see what happens you know and you need to to add this way of experimenting and trial and error and hey, let's test this and see what happens but that is not on the on the menu for these projects which are driven in that way it's, yeah. it's, I, th- I think it. I think it's not uncommon that you see that, for instance, if you have a, a big demo or something that you need to to uh, prepare. I have an example from an automotive uh, exhibition where a team had to deliver some kind of prototype or something, and then they selected people into a team that worked together for three four months, and the the outcome was extraordinary. So everyone was kind of shocked saying, but how come that this team, this was kind of a temporary team, they didn't know each other well, they delivered such good value in such short time. And I think that, that's back to, they were quite few, they had a clear objective uh, and they were had a scope that was well defined. I think that is often, I think that points towards the direction you're at uh, PMA, that having smaller teams with better focus is always winning uh, above having bigger teams with a more messy focus or messy scope. Absolutely. Yeah. S- Steve Dunning is talking about the power of the small teams. Yeah. The power yeah, of the absolutely. small team because yeah. it doesn't become that complex. It's easier, it, you absolutely. know, short <clears throat> communication that's, that's, paths. Yeah. And, and, and there's less reliance on a smaller team than, you know, there's no hiding behind that wider team group to say, well, you do all the work and I'll just sit over here and cheer you on type thing. Mm. Um, you know, and, and just hide and just ride the wave. And th- th- I mean, there's a running joke here in the UK, privilege, privilege universal, is that in public sector, it takes three people to do the job, one to do it, and then two to make the tea. Um, you know, and, and it's that <laughs> layer, th- th- those nonsense type layers 
within a team who just you know passively just you know, contribute no value you know and if you if you if you cut that and make it make it two people you know one to do the job and one to make the tea then fine you can you can rotate but at the same time you've got no one else to talk to with each, each other so you've created that small team and you you automatically holding each other accountable you make the tea today and i'll make it tomorrow fine let's move on yeah i have <laughs> For me, I get this picture in my head uh, uh, from when I took lean trainings and uh, they sh they show this small stream. And uh, if you're stressing the stream a bit, you lower the water in it. You will start mm -hmm. to see the big stones that is hindering the flow in the stream. So that's a bit uh, what we're talking about. Yeah, removing the people will stress the system because if this, the stream is too fat and happy, we may be not seeing these bot bottlenecks. So uh, we might have a lot of rework within the stream that someone is doing in the stream, but we need to remove also to see. Uh, but now we are also moving into something else. What should we do? Yeah, should we re just remove people? What's the value? Yeah, of <laughs> yeah but I think I, I came <laughs> to think of Sven Jörn Eriksson. You know him well as well, maybe David. A coach for England a few years ago in football or in soccer, he, he and did, yes. and I I've heard a story saying that he always have this one person in the team who is maybe not the best player, but he contributes to building the others to cheer them up so they produce much better. And that is kind mm -hmm. of that it means that he he focuses on the value creation and not the cost. So that we can at least relate to this topic. Mm -hmm. So that is yeah. an active decision saying that, okay, this will cost a bit more, but the value we get out of it is still on the plus side of things. Yeah, right? it's, it's not direct value, but indirect value. Yeah, indirect value. Yeah. Helping the others to perform better, right? Yeah. yeah, and I think that's typically what we see with team coaches, mm -hmm. getting the, the team to play better and work better together than having a quite dysfunctional team working in silos maybe and, and not yeah. getting the value out. Yeah. And and I guess one thing that's and it's a good point just to stay on football, but to stay yeah. to, to move on to women's football. And it's quite interesting because so the women's football come to more prominence in recent times and, and obviously Spain won the World Cup recently. And but what each of those successive those teams do is that they they don't just credit themselves for the work of the achieving the goal they go back in history and say we're only as good as the legacy that was created for us so i think in terms of that value creation if we say it's only within a finite period of time then you're 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 liable to be miscalculating there because there'll be value, there'll be huge value leaps in one period and then less a reduction in another. And so therefore, as you net it out, you know, it's either up or down. But the way to value um I guess value or efficacy, if you like, is to say it's it's a progression. It's it's it born out of legacy. It's heading in the di right direction. It's not intended to have finite points, although for financial purposes or regulatory mm. purposes, we will do that. But we're still staying in the game and we're reaching a higher goal, you know. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, and, and I think when when particular organization and when we talk about flow, people just don't understand exactly that that white that bigger picture. You know, that, that that kind of, you know, your future is bright, it's getting brighter. You know, you personally might not see it, but you're you're creating mm -hmm. that legacy for um future for your community, for society as a whole, you know. And I think that's a, always a good one when you talk to public sector because they're serving the pub the public, the community as a whole directly. That's that's their main customer, you know. It's um you cannot ignore that. Okay, if you're in a manufacturing or IT company, you might not be directly involved with your customer, but you should still see that your mm. impact and, and the value creation is greater than than you. Mm. Yeah. What is the first step then moving into this direction? If you are more of a traditional organization and you you have a resource allocation, uh, 
uh, highly connected to budget. It's inflexible and uh, uh, we suffer in our organization from it. So how what's what's the steps? We know of them. Question the annual budget and uh, start to make changes as needed instead to the annual budget. That could be a first step that you start to think like the budget is something that is a moving target. And um, don't reward people based on performance against fixed targets. Mm. That's a start. It's mm, a start. Any other ideas? I saw David, you were thinking of it. <laughs> I'm always thinking about it, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> it's not always sensible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Anders threw me there when he mentioned the the angling quote. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's always a tough one when you're dealing with traditional organisations because obviously, whatever I guess, regardless of how tiny the the habit that you're asking them to change. It's it's always going to be a difficult conversation, isn't it? Because the, the minute they hear you talking, then they're going to think, oh, you're talking about agile and you're talking about this and you're talking about that. And all that misconception that they have around agility. Um, and so you're kind of still introducing those half steps of, you know, how successful do you think you're being? Okay, you might be making a profit. But what's 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 your impact? What's what's what what are you really doing that suits the vision that you you set out or your founder set out to to achieve? Are you are you still on track for that? And if and if if the answers are resounding yes, then fine, carry on. If it's not, which is likely to be not, um, although they might not admit it, um, but you know, almost just pull those strings and say, listen, have you thought about? this changing the way that you view things not everything's in a uh, uh an annual cycle things are beyond that you know your, your existence is beyond that um your survival was beyond that um so can we think you know what 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 are what is it you are we still aiming to achieve what we set out to achieve and sustain that so um yeah absolutely from a financial perspective budgeting is always the um, the one that's completely uncertain um, and it is just predictive. So, so, so yeah, absolutely. Uh, PMA there. Let's let's go. Let's go. Um, Agile for finance. Mm. Yes. Alongside alongside and, HR, alongside HR as well. Yes, and and the, it's contact the guys from Beyond Budgeting. They are not talking about agility at all. We yeah. made the training together with them. They are not talking about agility. It's not about agility. It's about survival and it's about having a modern leadership and governance uh, for, for the future. No, well, that's, that's what it's all about, being profitable in the longer perspective and seeing that if we do it this way, what might we then, uh, what profit might we then have? Not the profit we have today. Maybe we can even no. increase it mm -hmm. to think in a different way. And, and maybe that's the thing, um, the approach to take then, P. Maria, is that we don't say that agility is the end goal, agility is the enabler, and mm. that we we know that that will probably be replaced at some point in, in, in the future, and uh, that will be that next aspirational step. And the, 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 there might never be an end game. There might never be, you know, but it's, it's always aspiring to to keep improving. To so something and, else. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, one other step, we have also talked about it, uh, it's to take the training with us at Agile People. And if you're interested, you can have a look at agilepeople.com and there you can find uh, the latest training that will soon be launched with uh, Beyond Body Team. So with that said, the FIKA is over for today. See you next time. Bye-bye. See you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Nice to Bye -bye. see you. Cheers. Take care. Good.